Hi, and welcome to the Why Gender and Social Inclusion Matters in Infrastructure mini podcast series. My name is Ruth Lancaster, and joining me is my business partner and good friend, Dr. Anu Monker. Anu and I are co directors of a small business called Equalis, which is a gender equality, disability, and social inclusion focused consultancy. We're based here in Australia and concentrating on the regions of South Asia, the Pacific and Australia. But just before we shift into this episode, our first episode, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are broadcasting from. I'm on beautiful Wurundjeri lands in Melbourne, Victoria, and Anu is on Ghana land in Adelaide, South Australia. We would like to pay our respects to elders past present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. SARIC, or South Asian Regional Infrastructure Connectivity, is a fantastic program funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs and their mission is all about first-rate infrastructure development that's socially inclusive in South Asia. SARIC is going above and beyond to boost knowledge and skills in the region. They're bringing you customised short courses, exciting study tours, awesome networking opportunities and this fabulous podcast series we're bringing to you right now. SARIC wants to get the conversation flowing and inspire some brilliant ideas. They want to build infrastructure that is inclusive for everyone with an eye on the energy and transport sectors as a start. It's all about ensuring our investments result in projects that promote gender equality and social inclusion. So without further ado, let's jump right into the topic of why gender and social inclusion matters in infrastructure. Anu, over to you to introduce today's guest. Thanks, Ruth. We're talking with Philip Martin. Philip is the head of impact and safeguards for the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, or AIFP, which provides loan and grant financing to Pacific Island countries and Timor-Leste to support the development of quality and climate resilient infrastructure. Philip has also worked at the Australian government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as a gender and infrastructure advisor for three years. Philip, we're really excited to be talking to you today, Um, and we wanted to start by sort of getting a better understanding of what it is that you do exactly. So what does your role as the head of impact and safeguards involve? Thanks, Anu, and thanks, Ruth, also for having me. It's a real honour to be part of your podcast. My job involves many things, but I guess the consistent overarching thing is that we work hard with a great team to understand and address risk and maximise development impact in major nation-building projects across the Pacific. For a bit of context, AIFFP was launched a little less than four years ago, and from a standing start, we've been very fortunate to partner with Pacific governments on what is now a very large portfolio of infrastructure investments, which, like SARIC, work on energy, transport, but also ICT, climate mitigation. The commitment has always been that an AIFFP project will bring high quality and better value for money. And this is an easy thing to say, but tricky at the best of times and even more so in the last few years, which has affected so many infrastructure partners. The context of COVID-19 lockdowns and urgent economic stabilisation and recovery has meant that the ambitions that many of us have, for example, vis-a-vis gender and infrastructure, have had to be negotiated in a much more dynamic and high stress and low resource space. So I guess the job really involves finding ways to achieve the highest standards and ambitions whilst working in reality, taking seriously the aspirations of partners, meeting them where they are, developing genuine partnerships. Day to day, I'd say this means my team and I work with Pacific partner governments, DFAT and other Australian government colleagues, and various experts from engineering consultants to women's rights CSOs to climate specialists, you name it, to enable good projects by applying proportionate tailored approaches to reducing risk and maximising benefits in our projects, which of course include gender equality and social inclusion. Thanks, Philip. One of the things that struck me about AIFFP when I was looking at it and in some of our previous conversations 
is that you have really considered gender at the start of this investment. So could you tell us a little bit about your journey towards understanding why gender and social inclusion mattered in infrastructure investment and development? I think this is both a sort of a personal and institutional story. Um, institutionally, as you well know, DFAT has been something of a, of a leader in investing in gender equality programming and particularly in pertaining to particular themes around women's economic empowerment and ending violence against women and also women in leadership. DFAT has, has long prioritised performance and accountability from ensuring that the spend through DFAT um, measurably moves the needle on gender equality. With the new government, we have a return of the 80% target of all new investments having to be rated for significant uh, gender equality impacts. So it's, it's, you know, the institution was geared to provide a, a good home for a new infrastructure financing facility, one that would take seriously and it be accountable on its gender equality ambitions. Personally, my journey to work for AIFFP was not through DFAT. I, I came here so the slow way, but I'm, I'm glad I did. It starts a long time ago, in fact. My grandmother was a prominent feminist activist in the 50s and went on to become the national president of the Union of Australian Women in 1960, an advocacy or, uh, organization founded by the Communist Party of Australia, actually, in, in 1950. So I grew up with Sunday lunch conversations, which described the UAW's campaigns around the cost of living, women's status, peace, industrial relations, community enhancements, and obviously women at the heart of all those questions. That sort of preordained me to a bit of a predictable path in a way. I studied MA and PhDs in gender and then worked in whatever ways I could to be part of gender equality, gender development um, initiatives. There's a lot of volunteering in gender roles with NGOs in Australia and Southeast Asia, roles with UN health and infrastructure agencies in my early 30s and a move to Development Bank in my mid-30s. And the lessons with different development banks really made me understand the risk and the opportunity in relation to gender and infrastructure. You know, and uh, as we all know, SARIC, AIFFP, the banks, infrastructure investments and the related procurement organise and allocate trillions of dollars each year. The allocation of money and opportunities done in a world where women remain economically disadvantaged compared to men in often very similar forms across time and generation and markets. In this sort of high potentiality, high value sector, I, I must admit I found some of the proposed gender solutions to infrastructure related problems to be sometimes a bit undercooked, certainly when I compare it to my experience working on gender and health programs. So I was always interested in figuring out what to do with partners where they are. It's an interesting job in general, and if done well, an, an important job too. So I've come to infrastructure and, and gender at a time from a, sort of a, at the end of a personal journey to get to this point, but also to work with an organization that, that knows a lot about, about how to invest in effectively in the Pacific for, for good gender equality outcomes. Wow, what a journey to get to where you are today. So imagine that you're speaking to a chief executive of a transport or an energy company. What would you say to them, Philip? Why should they be thinking about gender equality and social inclusion? I think, I know that um, there are a couple of ways to answer this question. It's a good question, but I'm not going to sort of answer the first way I think I would usually, which is, of course, the business case. The business case for a chief executive of a transport or energy company to invest in gender equality is there. It's it's out there. It, it exists. And there's been quite substantial studies done by both the usual suspects, which is UN agencies, government reports, but also new market entrants. Uh, major consultancies started to invest heavily into sort of gender analytics in recent years. And the business case is, is, is well established and the chief executive of any transport or energy company would probably be aware of that business case. I think a business case is important to start a conversation with a CEO, but, but it doesn't necessarily get you very far and it certainly doesn't end the conversation. Instead, I'd say to the CEO of the transport energy company, I'm here to work with you to achieve your company's objectives and part of that is through strengthening your competitiveness as an employer of choice for women, 
as a place where women can have a quality career and rise to whichever level they aspire towards. You, you run a business that doesn't contribute to exacerbate harms in the community and in fact works to, to redress. A business that allows all sorts of different suppliers, not not only men-led businesses to be visible and present in your procurement opportunities, just generally a better run business. And to do that, I think, I know, it's one thing to arrive with the realization that, you know, gender and infrastructure matter. But it's, the next step is, is to show the CEO that I've read the annual report. We understand your sustainability commitments. We have read the policies and procedures that the company has already committed to. The gender equality and social inclusion aspects that are performing well or not performing well. And we're in the business of helping that CEO to drive their business by, in part, delivering on already existing commitments. It's actually rare in my experience, I know any, any sophisticated business um, today typically has policies and procedures that include commitments to gender equality and social inclusion. They just don't often know how to do it very well or, or when and how to get started. It's not about necessarily always changing that CEO's view. That CEO may or may not believe passionately about the importance of gender equality. If they're a champion of gender, that's fantastic. But it's also great if they're just someone who wants to do their job well. And by showing that you're understanding the business, um, the commitments to gender equality and social inclusion, which, as I say, typically can be found in existing policy, and show the ways in which you can help them deliver on that, to do their job well, to make their company perform well, you tend to get past the upfront statement, which is gender equality matters for your business, to actually be in a much more interesting and, and, and rich area of conversation, which is here's how we can work together to make sure that your company performs well on these issues. So what I'm thinking is that with these large infrastructure investment projects, companies often are collaborating with government. There's a significant government involvement in um, infrastructure investment. What would you say to senior government officials about why they should be thinking about gender and social inclusion? It's a similar but different question, isn't it? And, and I think my answer is, is similar but different again. You know, government commitments are easily accessed. You know, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women is something that most, if not all, of the governments in our region have signed up for. There are various gender equality commitments in legal architecture and regulatory frameworks of all of our regional countries of operation. Australia is committed to these things. Our partners are committed to these things. You know, there are international commitments on rights. Government stakeholders, I think, have to be alert to this and are aware that this is part of their, of their job. However, again, it comes down to, I know, I think, who you're talking with. When I was working on health programs in previous jobs. You know, typically I would have meetings with ministers for women, ministers for social affairs, ministers for health, ministers for education. The nature of the meeting these days is with ministers of works, ministers of transport, ministers of finance. And these inevitably are slightly different, different um, conversations. So put into one side that we are, have already agreed that both partner countries have made international and national commitments on women's rights. Now we need to get into the business of, of, of operationalizing that in the area of the under discussion. And under discussion, we see governments and ministers accountable for the delivery of energy systems where there's currently no energy, of water systems where there's currently no water, of transport solutions in ways which enable the transportation of medicines, of fuels, of foods. You know, there is a lot of pressure on these senior government officials in these sectors to deliver the infrastructure on time uh, to cost, to quality expectations. They're accountable to the senior ministers or prime minister, their constituents. And, and if they can't credibly do that, then, then they're in a world of trouble. So I think it's a, an opportunity again, when you're dealing with senior government officials to acknowledge their reality that Gender equality ambitions in infrastructure are one part of the thing that they need to do. The other parts include, you know, the, the complex issue of financing and delivering complex infrastructure. There's a tension between the logic and time frame of political decision making and technical design and delivery pressure, pressures on the one hand, and the needs and requirements for long term and sound priority setting on the principles led infrastructure on the other. If you take seriously some of those upfront, ad hoc, high pressure tensions and show the government uh, official that you're sympathetic to their need to deliver X by Y at Z cost, but show that you 
and it'll also show that they're you're alert to white elephant projects, previous projects which have a cost overruns, inflated prices, delayed and low quality provision, non-completion, etc., and show that you can work with them to ensure that you're not adding to the risk of project failure. You're actually mitigating and reducing risk of project failure through measures to strengthen gender equality. It's, it's again, meeting them where they are, Anu, and, and showing them that this isn't just a concept that they should take on, but a process of high quality project management, which, which improves the overall outcome. Thanks, Philip. I was wondering, Ruth, do you have any questions for Philip? Uh, thanks, Anu, and Philip, thank you. That's been really interesting and extremely helpful. First, I'd like to say I would love to have met your grandmother and been part of those Sunday lunch conversations. Um, <laughs> I bet they were really interesting. But I do have just, and, and this is probably a little bit of a similar question, but what I've found in my conversations and probably more recently with businesses and governments, I get that I get a sense that today there's a greater willingness to consider social issues. So there's been a change there to consider social issues like gender equality, disability and social inclusion when talking about things like infrastructure. But the sticking point seems to be the what to do, maybe the what and how. So can you tell us, Philip, how AIFFP is operationalising gender equality and social inclusion? Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Um Indeed, and that's 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 very much my experience also, and I think AIFFP's recent experience. There's there's a lot of good intent. There is still a question uh, amongst partners and, and amongst some colleagues as to what exactly to do, and it can make people nervous. It can make people instinctively almost push back. You know, you accommodate and absorb, and then work with. And and so I'd say, I'd, you know, AIFFP's really sort of operationalising gender equality and social inclusion in at least a few ways, I think. One, it's a bit of a tautology, but by turning up, by intervening directly as an infrastructure financing partner, AIFFP actually helps ensure that quality decision-making around gender equality and social inclusion is part of infrastructure planning, is part of the ways in which projects are prioritised, developed, uh, conceived, you know, procured, uh, monitored, you know, we because we exist and we are existing within the Department of Foreign Affairs with its existing commitments. Just by showing up as a as a partner, we are we are ensuring that gender equality and social inclusion stay at the very top of, of the decision tree in partner governments' uh, considerations of what of what to invest in and 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 how. So, as well as taking a, a seat at the table, I would say AIFFP is also contributing another way, which is leveraging strategic partnerships. One of the th things I'm proudest of working under the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, again, is just how sophisticated, how robust, how comprehensive Australia's investments into gender equality in the region have been in recent years. I'm lucky to work, you know, in uh, at arm's length, but in, in close partnership with the Gender Equality Branch, with the Pacific Gender Team. There are myriad professionals who have dedicated large parts of their lives to working on gender equality in the Pacific. And by working in this space for so long, they have got a wealth of, of, of knowledge and, and experience that AIFFP is able to tap into. So we've taken a seat at the table. We're able to leverage Australia's strategic partnerships in, in gender in the Pacific. And we go a bit further. We certainly commit to fund and deliver institutional strengthening technical assistance, specifically around gender equality and social inclusion. A bit of what I was describing before in my, my earlier answer, which is to say a lot of the organisations we, we partner with already have policies and procedures um, that pertain to gender equality and social inclusion. It's just not always the case that they're very well implemented or very well understood or very well monitored. So... No, knowing that, you know, we, we typically start conversations with partners saying we're going to be a we, – we, we would like to be your partner, a financing partner for for years to come. If we're going to be that, let's let's work beyond just the, the fence line of this project as well as, you know, making sure the project is delivered in ways which strengthen gender equality. Let's talk about the institutional um, performance and let's talk about how that will look in five years, 10 years, 15 years. 
And that gives us a different um, horizon that uh, we can work to both. And then finally, you know, DFAT and AIFFP have a, do have a bit of a convening power. Some other donors, we bring them together to ensure there's a better coordination, sharing of lessons learned, better dialogue and better negotiation for shared support to the Pacific on, on gender equality and infrastructure. I'm quite proud of movement in this area to actually work with some of the traditional development banks to make sure that we're better connected and coordinated on gender equality ambitions. One last question for me before I hand back to you, Anu. Philip, what do you see as the common barriers we face when it comes to bringing gender and social inclusion to infrastructure development? And if you could just cover this one briefly, but how can we address these barriers? I think it's the common barrier. Um, it's not necessarily political will. It's not necessarily the technical challenges. Uh, I think there's a lot of good tools and knowledge products that can help solve problems of gender equality and social inclusion and infrastructure delivery. It's more around acknowledging and working within the, the, the sheer complexity of infrastructure projects. You know, really you're connecting some of the most powerful and least powerful groups in the world, formal and informal sectors, people from different backgrounds, classes, cultures, languages, uh, different accountabilities and incentives, all with a view to build an X. And these people are stressed they don't necessarily understand each other very well and they can continue to acknowledge that gender equality needs to occur, but it becomes always someone else's problem. So I would say the barrier remains that a lot of good gender advisors aren't necessarily effective in the space that they're trying to influence. And a lot of people who would, could and would be open to influence don't make enough space and time for, for the gender advisors to get in in a timely manner, um, and then in that say in that way can, may still experience that advice as a risk multiplier, i.e., their project may occur significant modifications. I would say that um, you know, in a, in a nutshell, as as all the different actors and factors affecting infrastructure projects, to make sure that the gender expertise, evidence, practice plugs into the decision making process around infrastructure, and that's that's a bit different to saying the barrier is with a particular department or a particular commitment or a particular um, level of ambition is to say that the barrier is something that we share, which is how to communicate and work together effectively in this, in this very important space. Terrific. Thanks, Philip. Anu, anything else from you? Yeah, while you were, um, you know, talking about AISFP and operationalising gender equality, what, what particularly impressed me, Philip, is that I think the effort has been made to sort of include explicit requirements around gender equality into um, project agreements and also um, not just that, but also looking at how you can incentivize good performance. Um, in, in our previous conversations, you also mentioned how gender analysis and particularly a gender and power analysis, one that recognizes that women are not a homogenous group, has been used to really look at the gaps that exist and how, how they can be addressed through infrastructure investments. And I think the work that AIFFP is trying to do with encouraging private sector partners to set, you know, gender equality goals, specific goals, and, and adopt things like the women's empowerment principles, those are, I think, really practical things that AIFFP is doing in operationalizing gender equality. And you mentioned, you know, engaging meaningfully with women's organization and leveraging the existing work that DFAT's doing in that region. So I think DFAT and AI, but you really need to be congratulated in, in how you've been approaching this rather complex issue. There's just a final question from me, and that is for our listeners, top three things that you want them to consider when thinking about uh, why gender matters for infrastructure. Thanks, Anu, and thank you for those kind words. That's wonderful to hear from such esteemed colleagues as you and Ruth on our progress. Three things that we think about vis-a-vis -vis gender and infrastructure right now from AIFFP is that currently we know that a major part of our region's human capability is, is untapped or heavily underutilised, which means that we have a legacy of infrastructure projects which doesn't well suit the needs and preferences of women. And that's, that's just a fact. And as I've said before, the business case and the, the evidence shows that more meaningfully connecting women into the um, decision-making processes, the supply chains, the, the design considerations, 
etc., will ensure better designed infrastructure which suits the needs and preferences of more and different people. Second, related to the first, we're in a process of profound recovery, uh, which we, we shouldn't ever forget. The COVID crisis in the world, but particularly in the Pacific, means that uh, societies and economies are fundamentally rebuilding. And the sorts of infrastructure that is built as part of that economic and social recovery either will or will not have inequality baked into it. If it does have inequality baked into it, you know, at this time of profound reset, I think we run the risk of a real rift in the social contract and a threat to the legitimacy of even perhaps some of the governance systems that we ascribe to. Previously, people could say, you know, infrastructure was built that way, but that was before they knew that was that was before they they had the sort of the smarts to recognise that gender equality mattered. We don't have that excuse anymore, and so this is why uh, we we think that this is a crucial moment in in gender and infrastructure in the region. And sort of related to to two, if we go forward with baked in inequality of opportunities and and unequal benefits between women and men, there is every likelihood of spillover effects on social cohesion and st- stability. Women could legitimately lose confidence that the systems will ever work for them in the Pacific. And that's not something that um, I think would, would be something that AIFFP or DFAT could accommodate. So they're the three things that we're thinking about vis-a-vis gender equality and, and infrastructure at the moment. Thanks so much, Philip. Every time we talk to you, we, we go away with learning something new and we really do appreciate your time with us today. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Philip. Okay, that's a wrap. Please use the comment section below to share your thoughts on this podcast and on any issues you would like covered in the future. Our next podcast drops in July, where we'll be joined by Palladium's Maven expert and Shivani Gupta from the Global Disability Innovation Hub to talk about disability inclusive infrastructure. We really hope you'll tune in for what will be an exciting conversation. To know more about SARIC, please visit their LinkedIn, Facebook and website where you can find more about the program and partners, including the World Bank, IFC and Palladium.